Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, to those of you who have just joined, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Nishima Chudasama. I'm the Director of Programs at Nest Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to protecting kids. We have a host of um, educational materials, curricula that are taught in high schools and elementary schools, and we're creating additional materials now for middle schools. Uh, we also have teacher training and parent workshops and, and, and um, a, a whole host of uh, resources available. Obviously, right now we are at a time when, um, as educators and counselors, you are being asked to and doing so much uh, to support your students. Um, and we wanted to create a space to really uh, share some of the specificity um, uh, of how to respond uh, at this unprecedented time. Um, we have a, a fantastic expert um, here with us today, Koryana, who um, I think her video is uh, about to come back on. Oh, there, there you are. Um, <clears throat> who'll be uh, sharing um, uh, and leading the presentation and we'll have some space for conversation. One quick note, um, we will be recording this presentation so that we can share it with you afterwards so uh, you have access to the slides and the, um, and the material that's presented. And the second thing I wanted to note is uh, we uh, really appreciated your feedback on the registration forms in terms of the specific matters that are um, uh, of significance and, and really important to you. And we'll be uh, crafting um, deeper dives into some of those topic areas that we can't uh, cover uh, uh, fully in this one hour that we have together. So please do keep that in mind. There is a QA and a um, and chat function uh, on this. So please feel free to add uh, or, or share any questions that you may have. Um, but for now, let me give it over to Coriana to introduce herself, to introduce herself um, and uh, I'll come back on uh, at the end. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, so my name is Coriana Sichel, um, and I am a psychology fellow at the Yale School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry um, and a doctoral candidate at NYU in the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development. Um, I've been working with NEST as a, an evaluation and curriculum consultant um, since, since 2016, and um, I'm really glad to um, be able to join all of you today, um, although obviously we wish it was um, in easier or better times. Um, so the plan for today um, is to kind of touch on these three objectives. Um, and I wanted to start out by thanking all of you for the thoughtful questions and concerns that you sent in with your registrations. Um, as Nishima said, we developed this presentation with all of those questions in mind, but given our limited time, I won't be able to address each and every one. Um, so please feel free to bring things up in our discussion afterwards. Um, and there's going to be a survey link at the end of this Zoom webinar. Um, and I hope that you'll take a couple of minutes to fill the survey out. It's six questions long. It could take you less than a minute, um, but it will give you an opportunity to request additional information and we'll use your responses to inform um, future workshops um, because we really want to make sure that we're meeting the needs um, of educators in these unpre unprecedented times. Um, so, with that said, um, our three main objectives for today are to give an overview of child sexual and physical abuse during the pandemic, um, to talk about strategies for preventing, detecting, and responding to possible risk, and to take some time to talk about self-care and managing stress um, as you know, you're juggling um, being teachers, being caregivers yourselves, many of you, um, and, and all of the strain that comes with everything that we're all facing right now. So as mandated reporters, teachers and other professionals, including doctors, school nurses, um, psychologists, and school personnel are legally required to report any suspicion of child abuse or neglect to the authorities. Um, and the federal government um, offers a minimum standard 
definition. Um, and then each state has their own additional definitions of child abuse and neglect. Um, so the, the Federal Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act of I believe 2010 um, states that child abuse is any recent act or failure to act on part of a parent or caretaker, which results in death, serious physical harm or emotional harm, sexual abuse or exploitation or an act or failure or to act, which pre presents an imminent risk um, of serious harm. And again, these definitions will vary state by state as do um, recording, sorry, reporting um, procedures. But um, at the minimum, this is what um, we define child abuse and neglect as. The signs of abuse and neglect are um, manifold. Um, here are just a few. Um, as educators, you all know these signs. You know what it looks like when students um, have been experiencing abuse and neglect. We see them withdrawing. There may be changes in behavior. Um, they might seem depressed. We have kids who try and run away from um, abusive contexts. They might sh show um, demonstrated or unexplained injuries. Um, and we might see a, a change in school performance. So a kid who was previously performing very well um, starts to not do so well in school. And we can also see developmental regression, particularly in the younger kiddos. So the signs of child abuse and neglect um, during this current pandemic are really the same as we would expect to see in normal times. It's just that they can be harder to detect. And we'll get into that a bit more um, later on in, in the presentation. Approximately five children die each day related to child abuse. Um, and the one thing we know for sure about estimates of abuse is that they underrepresent actual rates. Um, so on the slide, we've got some stats about um, rates of sexual abuse. Um, approximately three to four million reports of possible child abuse or neglect are made annually. And about 20% of those reports are usually substantiated every year. Um, new federal child abuse and neglect data was released in January of 2020, so before the pandemic began here in the States. Um, and we saw in that data an increase in the number of victims who suffered maltreatment for the first time since 2015. So that increase um, before um, the pandemic um, was the first one that we've seen in that data since 2015. Um, the, the majority of substantiated reports were for neglect, followed by physical abuse um, and sexual abuse. So in the face of the, the global COVID-19 pandemic, we're all dealing with a lot of stress. Um, parents may be out of work. Families are cooped up together in small spaces. Um, situations that may have been tenuous before might become excruciating um, for caregivers and for students. Um, and inequalities that we know existed before the pandemic along racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, um, immigration status lines, those inequities are now being exacerbated um, by the pandemic. Um, stress can manifest in uh, physiological, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral ways. And we know that social distancing means that parents who may have already been stressed are experiencing increased levels of tension. Um, and it means that students no longer get the social and substantive support that school provides, um, including accesses to, access to resources and um, interactions with teachers and peers that are really important. And um, the increased reliance on online communication modalities can mean that kids are at additional risk. Um, we are hearing reports of um, kids really accessing a lot of violent content on social media. Um, kids are also at additional risk for phishing and, um, and possible exploitation online, just given the fact that there are probably, um, they're, they're having more screen time um, and, and potentially uh, there's less supervision as families are stretched really thin. So what do we do with all of this? Um, you know, this, we're seeing an increase in um, 
reports of child physical and sexual abuse already before the pandemic. Um, and now with the pandemic and social distancing and school closures, um, this means that mandated reporters don't have eyes on kids. Um, so we wanted to think about, okay, how do we prevent, detect, and respond to possible risk um, that students may be facing? Prevention is really about prioritizing safety and support right now. Um, the vast majority of teachers and families want the same thing, and that's for kids to thrive. So how do we wrap around families and support students when they need us the most? The first thing that we can do is to validate challenges. As parents and students come to us with problems, um, we can say, yeah, it's really hard right now. That's always a good first step um, to validate, to acknowledge, you know, we're being asked to do unprecedented things. Um, our routines are completely disrupted. School no longer looks like school, at least the way that many of us thought of it. Um, and, and it can feel really scary to have so much uncertainty. The next thing that we can do is facilitate access to resources and services. Um, so making sure that students have access to food and um, the materials they need to be able to do their schoolwork. I know um, in putting this presentation together, I, I had the opportunity to speak with teachers um, and administrators across the country and know that districts are already working really hard on this. Um, and that as um, additional resources are coming online, um, we can provide even more supports to students and families. The next thing we can do is teach about healthy coping. Um, so validating and normalizing the challenges of the time of the times that we find ourselves in and then talking about what does it look like um, to cope in healthy ways that can promote resilience um, down the line. So are students engaging in self-care? Um, how are families dealing with frustrations of being all cooped up together in small spaces? Um, what might be some healthy alternatives um, if families are having a hard time or students are engaging in unhealthy coping? Um, strategies. Next, we can provide information about online risk and safety. So I touched on this a little bit um, a couple of slides ago, but as kids are spending more time online and potentially unsupervised time, um, their risk online is increasing. And so it's important to give families and students um, information about that. It's also important to support students in supporting each other. Um, the NEST curriculum um, does this through bystander interventions, but there are many ways that we can um, do this, really in helping students to think about what are their peers saying? Um, you know, are peers expressing um, distress um, or reporting things that um, really should be shared with an adult? Um, students are 100% online right now using social media. They're very active. Um, and so they might know things about each other that, um, that adults don't know. And part of um, supporting students in supporting each other is to let them know what those warning signs can be and then giving them access to resources, letting them know that um, adults are here, even if we're not physically together, um, we are here to support kids. And last but not least, um, we need to create opportunities to cultivate resilience. Um, so that means, um, you know, connections. Um, a lot of the self-care that we'll talk about later on can be helpful in cultivating resilience. Um, really everything on this slide can contribute to cultivating resilience and resilience will be what helps us all um, as we continue to live through this pandemic and then live through whatever comes next. Um, everyone can have resilience. Resilience isn't something that only some people have. It's um, something that can be cultivated by anyone. Um, and so it's thinking about how we can build resilience for ourselves um, and our students and our communities. So um, the last slide was really about prevention. Um, there can also be kids who are in trouble right now. Um, some will be the kids who you may have had your eye on all year. Um, others may be new. Um, it's really important um, to check on students, 
um, and let them know that you're there. You know the signs already, I'm guessing. Many of you, all of you probably know a lot of the signs of child abuse and neglect um, that we talked about before. You know the kids in your classroom who maybe were struggling. You know the kids in your classroom who might be a little bit more vulnerable um, and, and be in kind of delicate situations right now. It's really important, as I said before, to check in, um, providing those opportunities for one-on-one -on -one check ins. Um, one of the things that we learned as we talked to educators across the country is that some districts are really encouraging students to reach out by phone or Zoom um, or through Google platforms, um, while others are feeling much more limited in terms of um, concerns around FERPA and um, maybe relying primarily on email. Um, whatever way you can, it's really important to check in one on one with students, let them know that you care and that you're there, and that can make a huge difference. This is also um, a time to be strategic um, and to as much as you can get eyes on the situation. Um, so, you know, right now I'm sitting with my back to a wall. Um, you all can't see that I'm actually sitting in a bedroom. Um, for students, what we want to do is encourage them as much as possible if the, the content that's being presented is benign um, to actually not sit with their backs against a wall. We want to get eyes into um, the house. We want to see um, how they're doing. Um, and when you when you do that, it's important on these video calls to observe how um, how homes look. You know, see if kids um, or or other people who might be on the screen um, seem like they're increasingly frustrated. Um, that can be a really good sign that maybe an extra check-in is called for um, and that a student would benefit just from someone saying like, hey, I noticed, you know, it seems like you're having a really hard time. You seem to be really frustrated in class yesterday. I just wanted to check in and see how you're doing. Um, this also being strategic also means thinking about the content that you're presenting. Um, so I know one of the things that I've worked with um, Nishima and, and the Nest team in thinking about is how do we adapt content that could be potentially delicate or difficult for students to talk about um, in a home? How can, we, how can we make that content available to them um, while also making sure that they are safe? And um, so for these things, right, these might be times when you want to actually encourage students to have their backs to a wall um, so that other people can't see the content on their screens. You might want to encourage students to use headphones um, so that, that what you're saying is really just um, for their ears and not kind of being broadcast out into the home because we don't know, um, you know, really what students, where students are or, or what kind of circumstances they're in. Um, and using the chat function is really powerful. Um, so making that available to students and encouraging them um, to use it as much as possible. Another thing that, um, that is important um, is to think about um, paying attention to student assignments. We're hearing from teachers that students are expressing themselves, um, expressing distress, expressing things that might be related to abuse um, through student, through their, their assignments. Um, and so keeping an eye on those assignments and, um, you know, really reading them and figuring out um, when kids are kind of calling out um, for help. It's also really important to be an advocate for students and families in these times, and that can be really tricky, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means um, in the coming slides. And, and last but definitely not least, in fact, potentially most importantly, um, right now, it's about trusting your intuition, yourself, and your experience. Um, we're telling you all of these things, um, but I'm guessing that these are things that you're already doing um, our situations and circumstances are so different, but the content of your interactions um, is really pulling on the same experience and expertise that you bring to the classroom. Um, so that it might feel that while you're ill-equipped and while this looks so different, it's really about thinking about, okay, what did we do previously? How do we adapt that um, for our current circumstances? Um, everything looks really different, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is very different. So 
part of being part of advocacy and really the starting place of advocacy um, is empathy. Um, so I'm going to try and show share a brief video. There might be an ad, but hopefully it's queued up so that um, we don't have to deal with that. Okay. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. All right. So being an advocate means um, starting from a place of empathy. And I just love that little clip. Um, you know, I think that it can feel really tempting for us to try and do those things, to try and silver lining um, it, to try and, um, you know, say like, oh, well, you know, you want a sandwich? Like, I, I don't know how to deal with your, um, your pain that you're sharing or this challenge that you're sharing, but like, maybe here's this thing I can do. I can give you a sandwich. Um, or let me remind you of how this actually isn't that bad. And, and doing that is really a way of um, distancing from um, whatever's going on, which is totally a normal um, kind of impulse to have because um, the content that we're dealing with is potentially really emotionally difficult. Um, and it also is a good way of really cutting kids off and making people feel like they can't share. Um, so that's why validation um, is really always a good place to start. Um, the dictionary defines advocacy as the act or process of supporting a cause. And the fact that you signed up for this workshop and that you're here um, suggests to me that you're already working as an advocate for your students and their families. Being an advocate during this pandemic can mean that you're suddenly getting a lot more information about your students than you had before. Um, you might be glimpsing into their homes, for example, or seeing things 
um, that confirms suspicions that you may have had in the past, but you didn't know for sure. Um, and so I just wanted to take a moment again to recognize that that is a lot um, and that it can feel overwhelming um, and that this makes self-care um, particularly important. Um, being an advocate for others means that you need to take care of yourself. So here are some ways to be an advocate. The first one um, is to just be authentic, right? Be yourself, um, build rapport. Um, Nishima and I were actually talking about what this means and how difficult it can be and how in this time when we're all looking at computer screens and, and connecting through phones and things like that, we might feel the need to, um, you know, be, be kind of cool or be something that we're not. She talked about how she has a younger brother, right? And so if she's going to try and connect with him, what does that mean to, to be, on, be on his level, right? Think, think about things that he might think are cool. Um, and that's not what we would necessarily do normally. Um, and so I don't think that that's really what's called for right now. Um, you can build rapport by being yourself um, with your students. And you know, this is May, it's not September. Um, so you already have important, meaningful relationships with students and now it's just about deepening them um, so that students know that they can come to you um, for help and um, support during these times. So the next thing about being an advocate, really an advocate is someone who has tools, resources, and information to offer. An advocate is someone who might not know the answer to every question, but who has the ability to connect um, people to, to the resources um, and to maybe other people who might be able to have answers. Um, advocates are really connectors. They're facilitators and connectors. Um, and we'll be talking at the end um, about some resources that Nest has assembled um, and is continuing to augment as the days go by. Um, so, so there are you know, some concrete things that we can offer you in terms of um, resources. You also, I'm sure, are being flooded with resources in your communities as well. And sometimes those local resources um, can be the most helpful and most important. Um, so helping to problem solve and being proactive is, is related um, to this idea of advocates as people who facilitate and connect um, and who don't have answers, um, but who help students find answers. Being unconditionally supportive, this ties back into the validation um, and empathy, knowing that what everyone is going through is really hard right now. Um, and, and that's okay. And that's normal. Um, and that doesn't change the fact that you know we're here for students and families um, and trying to help them um, thrive and make it through this. Um, being sensitive and flexible, I think, is is particularly important right now. Um, you know, you might be seeing into students' homes in ways that you never did before, and. So things might be surprising. Um, students can come from a whole host of cultural backgrounds um, and homes can look very different. You know, we have a lot of folks from New York on this call, um, my home, my home uh, city. And um, so, you know, yeah, we can expect to see a lot of different um, things as we're, we're kind of gaining uh, lens into student homes. Victim blaming is this idea that, you know, we tell kids, well, you shouldn't have done that. Um, Nest works a lot, and I work with Nest a lot on preventing child sexual abuse. And a classic example of victim blaming is telling someone, well, um, you know, a young lady, um, well, you, you shouldn't have been wearing that skirt if you didn't want to get catcalled. Um, and so that's a really good way of shutting a connection down. Um, so victim blaming is kind of the opposite of what advocacy is. If advocacy is about connection, victim blaming is about severing those ties to the people um, who need us most. Following up is really important um, when you're an advocate. So following up with kids, with families, letting them know, here's what I did, um, here's what we're thinking. Um, and, and that can also carry through um, to reporting. So being an advocate and a mandated reporter is a balancing act. Um, again, 
Um, as a mandated reporter, when someone makes a disclosure, it's really important to offer validation um, and then empower them by offering options. Um, we know this from, from trauma-informed care. Giving kids options is really, really, really important, especially in a situation where they may have just made a, a sensitive disclosure. And those options don't have to be profound. Um, you're not saying, well, I can either call ACS to report this or I cannot call ACS, right? It's not that. Maybe it's something more like, would you like to be on the phone with me when I make this report? Or, um, you know, it sounds like you're you're having a really hard time. I'm so glad that you, you brought this to me. Um, would you like me to check in with you by email or text um, later on today? Just giving them any option, um, any two choices that they, they can, any two options to choose um, between that can kind of give them a sense of, um, of power and of agency um, that's really important right now. And so is being transparent, letting kids and families know, here's what the next step is. I'm so glad you told me this. Um, that's really difficult. And I really hope that, um, you know, that, that we can, well, not I hope, like we're, we will figure this out. Um, and, and so my next step is going to be to um, call um, someone in the administration. Would you like to be on that call with me or would you prefer um, for me to call you back afterwards and follow up? Disclosure um, is a process. And as a person um, who's receiving a disclosure, you are at the beginning of the of that process um, and how you respond to it is really important. And that's where the validation comes in, transparency, everything we just talked about. And it's also important to know that, that no two disclosures necessarily look the same. Um, some disclosures are purposeful. Um, the victim of the abuse wants it to stop and is ready to take control in order to change their circumstances. Um, some are prompted, right? Someone asks um, if, if how someone is doing, right, how a kid is doing, and then um, they find out about kind of what's going on. Um, some, some disclosures can be accidental. Um, so this might be happening, you know, in the context of um, seeing, seeing inside of students' homes um, or someone walks in on abuse happening, right? That's an accidental disclosure. Um, in accidental disclosures, kids are often not really ready to talk about what's going on. That doesn't mean that it's not important to, but it's just important to kind of keep that in mind that, um, you know, whereas in a purposeful or perhaps even a prompted disclosure, um, kids are ready to talk in an accidental disclosure, um, they might not be ready. And so it might be a little bit more difficult and it might look kind of different. Um, and piecemeal disclosures, um, kids may or may not be ready to disclose. They might kind of give you little breadcrumbs of information. Um, and, and it's really on us as adults to start to fit those pieces together and try and understand what's going on. So our third objective is to talk about self-care and managing stress. I love this um, graphic, um, you know, remembering back to when we all flew on airplanes um, and we were told by all of those flight attendants, if the oxygen mask drops down, you need to put your own mask on first and then help the person next to you. Um, and so in this section, we, we really wanted to recognize that the content that we're talking about is really heavy. Um, you know, I just took you through a very quick overview of how to um, receive disclosures that can be very difficult. Um, and everything can feel really difficult right now, and that's totally um, normal and, and consistent with the, the broader shared experience. Um, also, the folks on this call, you aren't only people's teachers. Many of you are also caregivers yourselves. Um, perhaps you're homeschooling your own little ones, caring for elderly relatives, pets, friends, um, roommates, houseplants. Um, and in order to show up and to advocate, um, taking care of yourself is really, really important. Um, so 
Compassion fatigue um, is the result of a secondary traumatic stress. So that's when you know you hear about something terrible happening to someone else, plus a primary traumatic stress. So while you're hearing about problems that your students are going through, you're also facing issues around what's the best way to get groceries, how to um, deal with loved ones who may be sick, um, or perhaps you are you become sick yourself, um, how to deal with loss and grief, um, and secondary traumatic stress plus tra primary traumatic stress can lead to compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue is when we just feel like we can't give anymore. Um, we are angry, we're exhausted, everything feels very heavy. Um, and it's all those negative aspects of helping others um, who might be experiencing their own traumatic stress. Compassion fatigue leads to um, looking like this lady, right? You just wanna put your head down on the desk. You can't do it anymore. You're completely at zero, at empty. Um, it's burnout, right? And it's really important um, to interrupt this cycle. I love this graphic. Um, it comes from the Compassion and Resilience Toolkit, which has wonderful resources for educators, schools, and families. Um, and I imagine that it might feel a little bit familiar to many people on this call. Um, we start out as zealots. Um, we wanna help everyone, we wanna do everything. Um, we feel energized by our cause um, and connected to our values. And, um, but then we start to feel a little irritable. Um, maybe we start withdrawing, possibly from those who can help us take care of ourselves. And then we move into the zombie phase, right, where it's just all too much. Um, and if that happens um, and we don't have an opportunity to renew and refuel, um, it's not sustainable. People leave professions um, because it becomes too much. But if we can refuel, if we can take care of ourselves, um, we can sometimes find compassion, resilience, and get back um, in the fight. I love this quote um, from Audre Lorde. I've become, I've come to believe that caring for myself is not self-indulgent. Caring for myself is an act of survival. When we think about um, self-care, it can be helpful to think about some different domains. So our bodies, how do we care for our bodies? Exercising, taking hot baths, taking hot showers, um, a massage, um, our minds. Um, you know, I know some people are turning to poetry um, and literature right now and finding um, a lot of peace and rejuvenation in that. Um, Sometimes watching a bad TV show can feel like a break and, and an act of self-care. Um, spiritual, connecting to our spiritual communities, um, whatever that means. Emotional, um, connecting with people who make us feel um, loved, connecting into our own experiences of love and gratitude can be really powerful right now. Um, intellectual, this ties back into some of the mind. How are we thinking about things? What are the things that um, make us feel rejuvenated? And, and what are those activities um, outside of work? And then social, um, really drawing on um, our social connections, whatever that means. Maybe it's Zooming with um, friends or loved ones. Maybe you've got a ton of Zoom fatigue as I sometimes um, find myself feeling. And then phone is easier. Um, but just making those connections, reaching out um, to people who we talk to regularly and maybe some people who we um, are not in as frequent contact with. So when we think about self-care, um, it can be helpful to think about what's worked before, what's working now or isn't working now and what we, what we might wanna do in the future. Um, so what is the self-care practice you did in the past that really worked for you? Um, but that you no longer do? Why did you stop? What can you do? What are you doing now that's working for you? Um, will you continue it? What could interfere with you continuing it? Are there barriers that you need to be on the lookout for? And then what is one self-practice that you would like to commit to in the future? Why have you not committed to it yet? 
and what needs to happen for you to do it. In the interest of time, I'm going to keep on um, moving, but I really hope that you'll think about these questions um, and maybe just pick one thing. And if you need some inspiration, um, I have three kind of low hanging self care fruit um, that I'm going to, to leave you with. So connecting with others, that social support is so important right now. Um, relying on healthy rituals, routines, and habits. Um, so finding, you know, some solace and comfort in the familiarity of those things. Remembering your values. I'm sure that your values probably have a lot to do with why you became educators and entered this field. Um, what are those values and connect with them? Being really specific about what your version of balance is. Um, I think right now people are doing a lot of social comparison. Um, so either comparing yourself to people who are doing better than you, better than you, or people who are doing worse. Um, and, and that's not really helpful. Um, so really focus on what is your version of balance right now? Um, what does that look like for you? What works for you? Not your neighbor, not your colleague, not your, your sister or your partner, but what works for you? Practicing mindfulness can be really helpful. Um, there are a lot of meditation apps out there. Um, I like to use five senses to practice mindfulness. So thinking about sound, um, smell, touch, taste, sound, smell, taste, sound, smell, touch, taste, um, and, and what you're seeing um, can be really a nice way of kind of grounding and bringing ourselves back into the moment. And then laughing. Um, it's sort of silly, um, but it can really help a lot. Uh, my mom actually texted me over the weekend on Mother's Day. I woke up to a text from her and she said, honey, is your refrigerator running? And I thought this is really odd. And so I went and checked on my refrigerator and it was running. And I said, yeah, is yours running? And she said, well, go catch it. And, <laughs> and that was funny. Um, and laughing felt good. Um, and even if it's just for a second, that can be really helpful. So um, the wonderful folks at Nest have put together um, a lot of resources and are adding more um, to the resources page on their website. Here, here's the URL. Um, I know a lot of folks on this call right now are, are coming from New York. And um, so we have some content on there that's specific um, to New York, but there are other areas that, that will also be coming online soon um, with some specific local resources. Um, there are also resources there around um, responding to abuse and reporting, um, abuse signs to look for, articles, um, national resources, and um, if you have any special requests, I really encourage you to fill out the Zoom poll at the end of this. It's six questions long and would be really helpful for us to kind of know what worked with this and what didn't. Um, this is our first um, teacher workshop of this sort and uh, to also inform future topics um, that we can offer. Um, before we open up to questions, I just wanna thank um, the really incredible um, researchers, educators, um, counselors who I consulted with in putting um, this uh, presentation together, um, a really amazing group of folks across the country. Um, so thank you so much. And that's it. Thank you so much, Coriana. And we do have time for um, conversation and uh, I see on the chat, folks are sharing some great resources with each other. So please do continue to do that. Um, I believe if I've done this correctly, you should be able to unmute yourself and just uh, speak in your question. If you're having trouble with that, please do use the chat and I can um, also uh, kind of um, say the question out loud. Um, but, um, but if there are any questions or, or any other um, information sharing uh, that you'd like to send us, uh, please do. I think, Nishima, that maybe the suggestion came just into us. Um, oh, I see. Okay. So, uh, so Carla Stack is, is sharing that uh, Amanda Mohammed and Julianne Schroeder have great resources available so, for some folks in, in Texas. I'm going to copy and paste that, Carla, uh, for everybody. Um, 
so that we can uh, share that out. And Coriana, if you had any questions for the group, I'll let you. Um, There's also a great um, podcast called Unlocking Us by Brene Brown that has been suggested uh, by um, Eva. Thank you so much for that suggestion. Yeah, I, I'm, I would love to, you know, welcome if there are any specific questions. Um, I, at the beginning of, of the presentation, um, Nishima, you and I both mentioned that, you know, we got so many wonderful, thoughtful questions in from um, our attendees, and we weren't able to necessarily address every specific one. But um, if there's one that someone wants to raise right now, um, I, I also would love to hear how you're all doing. Um, and, and kind of coping with um, the challenges of um, supporting students through these times, if there are any things that you've done that have been that have worked really well, um, that would be helpful to share with the group as we think about, um, you know, how to help our students who might be experiencing um, abuse and neglect during these times, that would be great too. And please do uh, do send me a, a chat message if you are having trouble with um, with speak. Oh, here we go, Eva. I just uh, see a, a picture of a beautiful dog, and you should be able oh. to speak now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, didn't realize my camera was off. I just wanted to thank you guys for um, putting self care uh, into this presentation so much. I feel like you know, people are really struggling to do right by kids and pushing themselves sort of beyond their limits. And that message is super important. So thank you. And thank you for the practical tips that went with it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that is something that's um, really important. And it can feel like the first thing that we kind of let go of um, in a time like this. Um, it's one thing that we've talked about potentially doing a separate workshop on, if that would be helpful for educators. Um, it might be nice to do um, even in smaller groups where we can you know, see everyone and have a conversation about what's working and, and maybe what isn't um, and how people are um, promoting their own resilience. So I see a question um, in the chat box. Thank you. I'm not sure there's an easy answer, but how to make sure that large urban districts wrap this into their reopening plans and not just focus on lost academic time. This presentation would be so excellent for our upper admin to see. Um, I'm so glad that it was helpful. I'm really, really glad. Um, that was really our hope. Um, I think that, yeah, this is a really important thing to think about. Um, I think it, it, there's some differences across districts from what, um, what I've heard. Um, around what uh, people are planning and how much they're thinking about um, the social and emotional implications of the pandemic and of um, social distancing for students as, as students are returning to school. I think it's really important to be thinking about, um, about that. Um, and also that just as we're seeing a dip in the number of reports being made right now because um, mandated reporters don't have eyes on kids, we're likely to see, hopefully, I would imagine we'll see an increase in that um, as, as people do get eyes on kids and start seeing like, whoa, something is really not working here, really not okay. Um, and, and I think, Nishim, I think Nest would be happy to, to bring this to, um, you know, if, if there's someone in particular um, that would be helpful um, at a specific school um, we would be happy to, to talk to those folks. Yeah, one thing, of course, we are all concerned about is the trauma um, and the, 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 this experience uh, is creating for everybody um, and giving uh, admin, giving teachers just some skills and some, some ability to kind of think about and, and see what 
presentations of trauma may, may look like as we're transitioning back into classroom time is something that we're really critically focusing on. And um, if any of you want uh, us to bring it to a district, we are talking to districts about using PD time in August to have workshops, even if it's on Zoom, because um, we're not quite sure what that will look like. I do want to read this great uh, question from Kara. Thanks so much. Uh, she says, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I'm worried about our kids going into the summer. Right now, they have regular check-ins with teachers and counselors. What do you suggest districts do over the summer when teachers and counselors are off? That's a great question. Um, so yeah, there's usually a handoff, right? We go from school um, in the fall and winter and we hand off to summer camps in the summer um, and many summer camps aren't opening. Um, I think that as much as possible, um, if, if it's possible within districts to maintain um, some contact or some, some check-in point with students, um, that can be really helpful. Um, I think that it's an important thing for really systems level um, districts to be thinking about and I encourage um, you to really bring that to your districts um, because I think you know there's there can be um, a, a kind of impulse on the part of individual teachers and students and counselors to say well I'll just check in with my kids during that time and that's really great and also that's putting a lot of pressure on specific um, counselors and teachers um, who you know then may not have as much institutional support um, to be able to kind of continue to do that and to respond so I think I know that in in different parts of the country on um, the school lunch um, programs are are being continued in different ways um, because kids um, you know have continued to receive um, free lunches during the pandemic and so they're there being there are some creative solutions about how to have that continue into the summer um, and I think that districts um, need to have a similar response um, at the district level um, to really begin to do that. The other thing I think um, that we can think about is what are the other community resources that are available to kids? And so if it feels like your district is not doing a very good job um, thinking about the summer and how to keep kids connected, um, what are the ways in which we can promote them having other connections as and education and access to resources around um, safety um, as they begin to get ready to transition into the summer? So does that mean connecting kids um, to local nonprofit organizations that are doing, um, you know, creative Zoom programming um, during the summer months or um, making sure kids have access to different um, types of information around what abuse looks like um, and, and how to report that. Um, I think that that type of thing um, is going to be really important um, to think creatively and flexibly as we, as we go in um, to the summer. And also for, and I think this ties back into the point about self-care, I think it's really important for teachers and counselors as individuals not to feel like they're doing this by themselves. Um, and so, you know, making sure that you're getting that support from, um, from your districts and letting your districts know, um, you know, this is something that we're thinking about and that we really need. Um, and kids need these, these, um, these connections. We do have time for a couple more questions or even if any of you um, have additional thoughts or resources uh, to share, we know that there's a tremendous amount of expertise just here. Uh, among all of you in your everyday lived experience and when we're constantly learning from you. So just invite um, any of your thoughts uh, as well as we kind of enter the, the last couple of minutes together. Um, While we're uh, waiting for any final questions, uh, I will share um, a couple of things. NEST is, uh, we're dedicated to supporting teachers um, however we can, uh, you know, at, at counselors, the whole school community. Uh, our approach to um, child safety involves the entire ecosystem of that child's life and ensuring that um, everybody uh, in the life of that child um, has the resources and, and the skills and the space to have conversations and share resources that they can have so if over the summer um, 
you know, any of you are interested in uh, additional topic work uh, workshops, I do invite you to email us. Um, at my email address was on that slide, uh, nishima at nestfoundation.org. I'll also put it in the chat box. Um, and I do want to uh, let all of you know that we have modified a, uh, a nine uh, less, it's an eight to nine lesson curriculum that um, range on the end is around a capstone project uh, that you can um, uh, teach uh, remotely. We've done a lot of uh, adaptations and modifications to enable that to address uh, many topics like healthy relationships and uh, you know, abuse and, and even bystander behavior because as Coriana said, the kids uh, in each other's lives are often some of the best resources. Um, and uh, Eva is sharing that there's a great mindfulness webpage by Tara Brock, B-R-A-C-H. Um, thank you so much, Eva, for these resources. Um, I'm adding that to the uh, chat box as well. Um, we have come up on the hour. Again, uh, our appreciation uh, from Ness to all of you for everything that you've been doing. You've had to quickly pivot. Um, and we are uh, learning from you all the time. We uh, have this open channel. If there are any resources you want to share with your colleagues, please send them to me and I'll put them on uh, that uh, website, which is nestfoundation.org slash COVID hyphen resources. Um, and uh, Coriana, don't know if you have any final words um, to, to add. Yeah, I, I really appreciate everyone coming together. Um, I think that as we're thinking about what it looks like to transition back, um, I think that um, I think that some of the content in the NEST curriculum, um, the program for the right to healthy relationships, can be really important. Um, and I know that Nishima, there's more information about that available on the website as well, um, especially around that bystander piece and recognizing signs and just understanding what is consent um, and doing it in a way that really empowers um, empowers uh, youth. Um, and I'm seeing in the in the chat box that yes, the curriculum is only available to trained teachers. That's true, um, but I think that Nishima is very happy to um, facilitate more trainings um, so that we can get it out there. The reason that the curriculum is only available to trained facilitators is because um, the some of the content is very sensitive, and it's really important that we um, are really intentional about how um, how it's taught and that we give teachers um, an opportunity to unpack some of it and, and the space to have their own um, reactions and experiences. Um, so, you know, to, to really support teachers um, as you all present this content. Um, but yeah, I think Nishima would be happy to follow up with anyone who wants more information about that. Um, and, and thank you all for um, everything that, that you're doing. And I see a bunch of questions in the chat box. Um, how do we get access to the training? Is online training available? Um, yes, I think that Nest has also been pivoting very quickly um, to, to make all of that available. And Nishima, if folks are interested in getting access to um, the curriculum, things like that, is the best next step for them to email you? Absolutely, yes. If you just email me, uh, our team will respond. Um, and uh, I, I like everyone, we're trying to figure out how to make it work on Zoom. Um, so please do get in touch and, and we'll, we'll work with you uh, to make it as, as available as possible. Uh, well, and then I the get, last thing sorry, I would just yes. plug is please do, please do um, fill out the, the post-Zoom survey because that will really help us um, planning going forward. Thank you. Yes, thank you again. Uh, thank you to all of you. And we look forward to staying in touch uh, and seeing you again on future webinars. Um, have a great rest of your week and uh, we appreciate all of you. Thank you.